This week on the True Jolly Podcast, it's the lineal yeah. heavyweight champion of the world. A.K.A. the Gypsy King. Everybody wants to be a boxer today, doesn't Isn't it? They? Yeah. Superstars, rock stars, movie stars, yeah. YouTubers, yeah. they all want to be fighters, don't they? There's it's something in it. Some people work hard for stuff and they get there and they enjoy it. I don't know what that feels like because I'm always looking to do something more. Beating Klitschko, going to beat Wilder, going to Saudi Arabia and fighting Braun Strowman. Whatever I do, that ain't enough. I'm always looking to, for more. I'm always looking to better that. Don't make men like me anymore. I'm a dying breed. routine for me is having a normal life and not getting carried away with all the glitz and glamour and all the bullshit. Like I said, I go from Las Vegas back to Morecambe, topping the bills in Las Vegas, to changing shitty nappies in Morecambe, <laughs> taking the bins to the tip. You'd be Dana White's dream. What would it take for them to get you in a UFC octagon? It wouldn't take a lot. I've got three fights left on my contract. When they're up, I'm coming for every UFC heavyweight there is. You can't teach me anything about boxing. No it. one can. Because what I don't know about boxing ain't worth knowing. Train hard, eat well, and get your rest. Andy Ruiz, let's just use him. He's, he's a great example. Little fat pig. Comes in on three weeks' notice. Murdered every donut and taco in the whole of California. And then goes in with a man who's had a 12-week training camp with every sports scientist in the United Kingdom. But the little fat fella goes and then bowls him over in seven rounds. How do all them scientists look at me then and say, this is better, this is how you should do it? Because they can't. As a fan of you, there was like obviously concerns after the last fight because this guy gave you a real challenge, to be fair. He really yeah. put it on you. How do you feel when you look back at that fight now? I loved it. Loved every minute of it. 47 stitches, what's that? What's 47 stitches to a motherfucker like me? He can please remind me! <laughs> This week on the True Johnny Podcast, it's wow. the lineal heavyweight champion of the world, Tyson Fury. I've wanted to say that for a while. I know, right? That's crazy. I know you coming. finally say it. I, I yeah. feel like sounds, sounds good. Can you say it again? Yeah. Uh, the lineal yeah. heavyweight champion of the world. AKA the Gypsy King. <laughs> That's there it. Go. The Gypsy and the Geordie King. I'll take it. I'm gonna I'm gonna adopt that. No, is that See, all right? I'm, I'm not too sure. Like, am I allowed to swear on this oh, podcast? Everything. Because on Mike Tyson's podcast, we got up to some crazy yeah, yeah. conversations. Well, we've got some of that as well, if you want. No, <laughs> just like, <laughs> you can do anything, mate, honestly. Okay. Yeah. So just welcome. so I know, you know, yeah. just so I know what we're um, catering for here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I suppose the burning question on everyone's lips is, are you getting the Christmas number one with Robbie Williams? Is that It's being released very soon. Yeah. Um, it's a very catchy song. I enjoy it. Yeah. Everyone who listen to it say it's a good one. So I'll let you listen to it in a minute. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? And uh, exclusive. Oh, brilliant. We've had just, Robbie just on. Just you, not on, not on the podcast. Yeah. Sure. And uh, we'll see if you like it. So it's going to be exciting times. Yeah. Robbie is a bit of a, he was a fan of this podcast. Like he was the big, first celebrity I got yeah. on. He's a lovely guy. Did you get on well with him? Yeah, yeah, he's a nice fella. He's a bit of a boxing fan as well. He's just taking it up. He is, yeah. He's, he's get, been training with uh, Tony Jeffries, oh, hasn't that's he? That's right. I, do you know he's called out... Um, one of the lads from Oasis, he wants to like a celebrity fight, like the YouTubers. <laughs> See, everybody wants to be a boxer today, doesn't Isn't it? They? Yeah. Is from that a bit weird for you? From superstars, rock stars, movie stars, yeah. YouTubers, yeah. they all want to be fighters, don't they? There's is, something in it. Is that weird for you to see everyone trying to follow in your footsteps? No, not really. I think it's fantastic for boxing because, yeah. you know, you've got very famous people wanting to become into the game. Um, it only brings more profile to, to the sport that I love. Did you see the KSI Logan fight? I've never seen it. No. Then. Because no. I've seen you talking about it a bit beforehand. Now, you're quite supportive of it, which I thought was really nice. Yeah, listen, I support anyone who comes into boxing. You know, it's, uh, it all brings more eyes to the game. And the more eyes are on it, it makes it better for the young up and coming fighters of the future. Mm. We've got your book here, by the way. If you haven't uh, already, you have to check it out, everyone. I've been reading it. It's really like from you. It, isn't, it doesn't feel like someone else has like, interpreted your story. Like, no, it's well, like we you're speaking down, to them. We put a lot of time into yeah. that. I started writing that book before I started my comeback. Right. So when I first started writing that book, I was weighing 28 stone and down and depressed as ever. So I think from the beginning of the book, you can tell that towards the end, I'm getting happier again. All yeah. Right through. So yeah, it's... Uh, is, it, is it strange reading those thoughts back in your head and seeing how differently you find yourself thinking now? Definitely. Like reading some of that stuff in that book 
just thinking about how I was back then to how I am now, total different person, total different mindset, yeah. and what a difference a year can make, two years can make, and it's a dramatic turnaround, dramatic change. Yeah, because I remember in the build-up to what was supposed to be the Klitschko rematch, yeah. you started saying things that a fighter should never say, like, I hope he knocks me out. And I was like, what, 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 what is this? Like, what does yeah, this mean? Yeah, because I was very unwell at that time. Yeah. Very, very unwell. And at that, that time, I didn't care if I lived or died. Mm. There's an interesting story. I was in training camp uh, in Holland. And I just, I just didn't care. I was sparring big heavyweights. And I was just letting them punch me all about the head. I wouldn't even defend myself. Just stand there, let them tee off on me. And then in between rounds, I go back and headbutt the corner posts. They was like, what is this? We've never seen anything like this. I said, I'm a lunatic. I was going mad at him, just letting him hit me. And uh, yeah, it was a uh, tough times to go through, but you know, I wouldn't change a thing because it's a part of me and it, I wouldn't be the man I am today without all that happening to me. With you, you've got such a story, I almost don't know where to start. But in, in terms of um, when you go back through the, the mental health struggles that you've had, is there a, a, a moment that stands out early on where you feel like a where and a when, where you... You look back and you see times where it was creeping in. And can you pinpoint anything that sort of began all this? I don't think it's something that just triggers. I think you've either got it or you haven't. Right. I've struggled with mental health my whole life. But up until a few years ago, I never understood what it was. I just thought I was feeling down or whatever. Right. And I used to have anxiety all my life as well from being a little lad. Right. I used to think like something was going to happen and I'd be all anxious. But I didn't, I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. Up until I've, I've become educated on the matter, I had no understanding or mm. no clue what mental health was. I just thought it was a, a feeling that I had, mm. and that was it. Mm. Just like many other people out there who have the same feelings and don't understand it. I'm very grateful to you for speaking out, because uh, being a big man myself, seeing a big man like you, I've had uh, you know suicidal thoughts, anxiety, that impending doom like something's about to go wrong, the world's yeah. about to end, and you're just sitting there and nothing's happening. And yeah. seeing you come out and speak about it just gave me sort of a bit of uh, a bit of courage. Like, yeah, this is all right. You can say stuff like this, and I've tried to do it myself, so yeah. thanks. Um, but, you know, you've dealt with it in a different way. I, I feel like um, you spoke about, like, uh, God and religion and things like that. That's helped you through it. Um, but it sounds like this is a medical thing as well. So uh, what kind of things have you used to battle this? I've used prayer and I've used training. Really? They were my medicines for the comeback, mm -hmm. basically. I never started back training to, to box again. I never thought I'd ever box again. I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. At this time, during that book being wrote, I didn't want to return. I had no interest in returning to boxing. I hated boxing, mm -hmm. although I fought because I was that unwell. Everything I held dear to my life and everything I respected didn't mean anything to me at that point. Mm -hmm. So I started back training to, to get fit again, to lose weight. And all, wh while I was in the, uh, the, the routine of training and all that, I got well again and made a comeback. <laughs> and got yeah. back into boxing, but I never I never did take any medicines or anything like that. I think I took like two days of um, of medicines, pills, while I was away and I was feeling very unwell. I took two days of pills and I thought, this is not for me because like me, I've got an addicted personality mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't want to be addicted to medication my whole life. But my advice would be to anyone who, who's suffering or anyone who's got a problem, the sooner you see the doctors, the sooner you can get well again. Mm. You've got to admit it first, uh -huh. and then you've got to seek medical advice to get well again. I found like talking to people to be like a really good uh, sort of way of therapy, even if it's just your best mate or family members. Who, who was it who you sort of talked to and confided in? It wasn't a matter of me talking to one individual. I was talking to millions of people <laughs> during my full struggle. I was very open. I was doing videos all the time. Yeah. And I was doing videos when I was down, videos when I was up videos all the time and I was talking to everybody at that oh. time I was trying to get well again and inspire others at the same time so yeah. it was a difficult journey for me um, but what helped, really helped me through was setting short term goals and having a, a, a routine a structured routine in my oh. life um, and that's how I got through it without that routine without routine in my life if I have three days where I've got nothing scheduled and I don't go to the gym I'll be as down as I can ever go again mm -hmm. it's like people say oh you've defeated mental health no I haven't but I've learned to maintain and manage mental health and people are saying now oh he's a gym junkie he can't leave the gym alone well that's true 
I can't leave it alone because I don't want to go back to the Hotel California again. I want to be in the real world and live in a normal life. So that's why I go to the gym so often. Do you think you do live a normal life? Yeah. Or do you think it's? Do you consider your life to be a normal everyday life, the same as everyone else? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I do now. Anyway, yeah, I didn't before. Yeah, because it definitely was far from a normal life at that point. Yeah, yeah. Listen, when when you're very unwell, nothing's a normal life. Mm. But when you're thinking straight and you're in a well mind, then you can go back to reality and just get on with your life. What did you? What do you um, get from prayer? Because I know there are so many people that sort of um, say that's such an important part of their life. Listen, I, I've all I've grew up around it, so to me it's a normal thing. Mm. I pray every day and every night, and that's it. But you know, the thing is with religion, it divides so many opinions. So it's something that I've learned to keep my own business to my own self. Right? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because I've, I've because heard, yeah. you might say, "Oh, yeah, the, the, the prayer and religion helps people," but then I'll have another twenty people say, "Oh no." that's wrong and there's another 20 say yeah that's okay so there's so many opinions and so many people that you can upset just by sharing stuff so you know i don't even want to go into it my relationship with god is a personal relationship yeah. and it's none of anybody else's business at all and that's kind of similar to mental health in a way that everyone's mental health is quite specific to them 100 percent. and what works for me doesn't necessarily mean it'll work for exactly. you, you you or you yeah but there are it's elements a, which are similar in everyone's they need 100%. that routine really helps a lot of people that routine on the short-term goals definitely work mm -hmm. I, I, you know do you, do you feel like boxing is that routine part of that routine for no you? boxing has nothing to do with it at right. all it's almost two separate things yeah Right. The routine for me is having a normal life and not getting carried away with all the glitz and glamour and all the bullshit. Right. Yeah. Because it's all very unimportant and you should never get carried away in it or never lose yourself or lose the fact to what you stand for and who you really are. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to do that and get caught up in all rubbish. But at the end of the day, when it's all over, you're just another bare bum in the shower and nobody wants to know you. What was the relationship? Fact. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love how honest you are. Was it impact? It was impacting the relationship with the people around you at the time as well. How was it impacting your relationships with your yeah, wife? It, was, it and was terrible. I was on the rocks. Listen, when you're, when you're thinking about killing yourself every day and there's nothing more that you want in your life than to die, you're in a terrible place mm -hmm. and it affects negative. I was so negative all the time and I could be around people and make them negative. Mm. So it's very important for me not to be around negativity because I'm one of them people who can be brought down very quick mm -hmm. and I don't want it, you know. I've learned, I used to worry about a lot of stuff in my life, worry about what people think, worry about making people happy, worrying about X, Y and Z. Now I don't. I worry about being happy now and being happy today and tomorrow and I don't look past that because when I start looking to the future, which we're not promised, only recently what I say has been backed up. My uncle went for a Sunday dinner. On the way there, he had heart attack and died outside the road. So that's how we're not promised tomorrow. So I live today because I know that I am not guaranteed to wake up in the morning. So I'm just going to be happy for now. And that's how I live. One day at a time, if I go to bed sad tonight, I think to myself, you know what? Tomorrow's going to be a brand new day. I'm going to wake up happy. And I'm going to be positive and I'm going to crack on. I'm not going to worry about anything because nothing's going to worry about me. And I've, I've, I've got that through facts of my life, what's happened, experiences. You seem so mentally strong. Yeah. And after you going so low and coming back like that, it's interesting that you still admit that you still have those battles on a daily basis, but you, you overcome them with that structure. All the time, I get up and downs. You know, you can't, you never escape it. I've said this quite a lot, yeah. but I'm going to use it again. I liken mental health to a famous song that the Eagles wrote called Hotel California. And there's a verse in there, you can check out any time you want, but you can never leave. Yeah. And that's mental health. You can check out any time you want, but guarantee you'll always go back mm -hmm. at some point or the other, for sure. It's oh. a long, hard battle and it continues forever, mm -hmm. but it can be maintained. It doesn't all have to be gloom and doom. It doesn't have to be sad. It doesn't have to be painful. It can be maintained and managed with the right structure and the right program. In your, in your boxing, did, did the mental health um, ever affect your performance, like performance anxiety? Did, did you ever find no, that? like... Tyson Fury as a boxer and Tyson Fury as a human being. It's like um, Superman that. when he's Clark Kent and Superman. It's two, two different people. Really? So Tyson Fury, the Gypsy King, was never affected in boxing matches, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, I could be totally depressed and down, but when I go into a boxing ring, Superman returns. Mm -hmm. It's a different person. 
It's like almost a different character, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. There's two people there. There's Tyson Fury, the husband, father and son. And there's Tyson Fury, a boxing man who, who fights all over the world and does whatever. Right. Like I said, I go from Las Vegas back to Morecambe, topping the bills in Las Vegas, to changing shitty nappies in Morecambe, <laughs> taking the bins to the tip. Did you enjoy it's a total you opposite end of yeah, the Richter yeah. scale. But you enjoy, uh, there is an element of enjoying being a dad and going back it's, to Morecambe it's the and best. loving that. Nothing yeah. can compare with it. Mm. You know, like I said, getting carried away with all that glitz and glamour, topping the bills and the biggest venues and the biggest fights in the world in Las Vegas, where all dreams are made of and come true and all that sort of stuff. Then going home and going back to reality, school runs, coffees in the morning, gym, five kids to attend to. You know, it's it's a total different uh, yeah. turn of events. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was the Vegas lifestyle partly how you ended up losing control at one point, do you think? No, it, it wasn't. Um, I'll tell you how I had the breakdown. It's very simple. For someone who understands mental health, it's very, very simple what happened to me. I suffered with mental health my whole, all life but always put it to the back of the queue, back of the mind, because I always had a goal of becoming heavyweight champion of the world. Nothing was ever going to stop me from beating Vladimir Klitschko in, in 28th of November 2015. That was my be-all and end-all of my life. Nothing else mattered. That was it. Not Whatever happened to me in my life, I had a lot of bad traumas happen on the build-up to that. But I put it all to the back of my mind. I didn't want to think about it because I didn't have time. I had a, I had a goal. I had a, a burning desire to achieve greatness. And I always had that goal to concentrate on. I always had it there to say, nope, I'm not going to get brought down by that because I've got to do this. And going into that fight, I was almost afraid to win because I knew for a fact I didn't have a goal anymore after that. So that I almost, I knew beforehand I was going to go downhill from there because when you set your life, life to doing something, you set your stall to beat a certain person and become heavyweight champion of the world, you get there, then what? Mm. It's like you work all them years. I worked from being 14 to, to 28 years old to becoming heavyweight champion of the world. And then I arrived. I thought to myself, is that it? What now? And I knew it was going to be disaster because I never had a goal anymore. The devil makes work for idle hands. I oh. never had that goal. I never had a drive. I never had a purpose yeah. in life. And when you've had a purpose, my whole sole purpose forever had been boxing and training and boxing and fighting to the top. But when I arrived, it was like... I don't have any further I can go now. That's it, my life's over. That was the attitude I had. Yeah. I, said to, I said to the guys in the gym, I said to my Uncle Peter, I said to the Christian strength and conditioning guy, I said, oh, what are you going to do when you win? I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Be down and depressed for about two years after the fight. What? 100%. I said to Paris, after I got back to the room that night, after being glitched, go, I got on my knees and I, I, I thanked God for about half an hour. And after I was finished doing that, it was late because I, I got drug tested and press conference and all that. It was about four in the morning. And I, she said, what now? I said, that's it. I said, enjoy this while you can. I said, because it goes downhill from here. There ain't no more further you can go from this. This is it. All downhill from here. And she was like, what do you mean? Before I went to Germany, we all had a little meet up, me, my dad and my brothers. And they said, oh, when you win this fight, what are you going to do? I said, I'm not going to box again. I won't box again. Why? You worked all your life to get to this point. Because that was it. I knew what was coming and I couldn't stop it. There's an emptiness sometimes when you reach goals that is so irritating, I find. like, Because I'm someone, I feel like I'm a pleasure seeker. I'm someone who constantly needs to be chasing something down. And I, I'm so annoyed at myself sometimes when I do hit a goal and I just feel like deflated afterwards. And it's such a, like, what's wrong with me? Like, why can't I just enjoy, enjoy this? It. That's me as well. So frustrating. No matter what I've ever done in my life or what I've achieved, where I've been, I've always felt deflated after a, a, a good achievement. Not once have I ever enjoyed an achievement yeah. that I've worked hard for, ever. Is that why you, you've achieved greatness though as well? Because you don't find the same thing satisfying that an average man would? Well, we all find the same thing satisfying. No matter who we are, what we are, we can only do the same thing. We can go out for a drink, mm -hmm. get sackless drunk. <laughs> we can go to the, for, for something to eat. Mm -hmm. What else is there? What else can a human do on this earth? Yeah. We can eat, drink and sleep. And what any order you want to do it in, and that's it. Basically, that's it. So everyone has the same enjoyments, but it's some people work hard for stuff and they get there and they enjoy it. But well, I don't know that. I don't know what that feels like to enjoy right. a certain aspect of of hard work. 
because I'm always looking to do something more. That's never enough for me. Like beating Klitschko, going to beat Wilder, going to Saudi Arabia and fighting Braun Strowman, whatever I do, that ain't enough. I'm always looking to, for more. I'm always looking to better that. And there's just some things in life that can never be bettered, and I understand that. Do you, do you see that as a gift or as a curse sometimes? It's a gift and a curse. Right. Because it gives me a, a steely attitude where nothing's going to going to set me off from my goals right. but then when I get there it's like okay I've done that that's the impossible done what next what other else can I achieve now but it comes to a point in life where when is enough enough mm. people say to me oh you got three fights left on your contract what are you going to do then sign another contract another 10 year deal why would I want to what more can I do as a man as a person as a human being as a boxer as an entertainer as a singer, as an author now. What more can I do? Philanthropist. Oh, yeah. yeah, philanthropist. Yeah. Yes, whatever. You know, it's... What is the goal? not much more. That my, my goal now is just to be happy. I've achieved, I've achieved more than I ever thought that was ever possible mm. in life. And more. And I know that all the achievements in the world are really unimportant because you come in the world with nothing and you'll definitely leave with nothing. That's for sure. Just here filling voids, filling gaps. So does um, legacy not mean as much as it used to to you? Leg legacy has never meant anything to me. Not once. Even before I beat Klitschko, I said, none of them belts, none of defending belts 20 times and whatever mean anything to me. I'm cut from a different cloth. I'm a different breed to most. They don't make men like me anymore. I'm a dying breed. And that's it. What, I, what all I want is to be happy. And that's it. And whatever it takes to to find happiness, that's what I will go to. And I've been to hell and back, mm -hmm. and I'm prepared to go to hell and back again to get happiness. You know when you say they don't make men like you anymore? As an old school bloke, what do you think about modern society and the way it's heading? Do you have a feeling about it generally? Do you know what? I have no feeling towards it, really. I have no, I have no negativity and no positivity. It's just, it is what it is. Mm. I just let everyone crack on with their own business. But like I said, for me to go around thinking about other things and get me, getting involved in stuff that don't concern me, mm -hmm. I have no real interest in it. The only thing I'm interested in is being happy, making myself happy and those around me and spreading positivity and trying to help as many people as I can while I can. What That's makes it. you happiest? What makes me happiest? Yeah. Going to the gym. Okay. I'm working out. Yeah. Like I got up this morning at 6 a.m., went for a run in the rain, pissing down it was. Yeah. But I'm not going to miss that because that makes me happy. Then I come back, got the kids up for school, took them to the, to the school, and I went here and grabbed the train and come straight here. So being routined and being fit, yeah. can't, you can't be anything better than in shape and fit. Mm. And if they said to me, right, you can have a billion dollars, but go back to where you were two years ago, or you can be a, a skint man on the street living in a tent, but you're going to be fit and healthy and mentally well out of that one place. Mm. A so, billion dollars and where you were a few years ago would be a bad combination as well. <laughs> There's all that money to spend. It, it, but what are you going to spend it on? Yeah. yeah. Like I said, you can only do the, the same thing. Go to the pub. <laughs> Go to the pub and you can buy a lot of drinks for 100 quid, can't yeah. you? Yeah. You can get sackless for 15 quid. <laughs> Is that why you donated the... Deontay Wilder purse because it was a it was a sign of to show everyone else what you are truly about. No, and I don't I don't do things for pats on the back. I don't do anything. I don't whatever I do with my own money and whatever I do for charities. Mm -hmm. I don't do it for publicity. That's why you never hear about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not I'm not interested in becoming a, a, a do gooder mm -hmm. or a jobs worth. For, oh, look at Tyson, he thinks he's a top bloke because mm. he's, uh, he's helped a woman across the street or he's given the shoes off his feet to a man. I don't want praise from, a norm, from people. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't do stuff. I don't help other people for credit. I don't care if anyone knows about it or they don't. It's one of them things, you know. Mm. It's, it's something that I'm not bothered about praise mm. at all. Is that because in the past you've had both massive criticism and massive praise that you treat those the same now you're just like look I am who I am have, have you learned to live with whatever you know I don't have any um, hard feelings towards anybody or any listen people can say what they want about me no interest right. they're not but, people saying stuff about me it's all sticks and stones isn't it we learn about it in primary school mm -hmm. and that's it even when you were depressed though, because for me, when I'm feeling down and I, I work on social media and when you're getting it constantly, it can make things a little worse. Were you good at just blocking that out even when you were I down? Don't, I don't go on social media. Mm. 
I don't. I put what I need to put out there up, like so, like Instagram posts mm -hmm. or Twitters, tweets or whatever. But I don't read replies. I don't answer messages. I don't look at the indirects. I only put out. It's only to me. It's not personal. Mm -hmm. I don't need to have a virtual reality life online. The people I care about, I can see them face to face or phone them on the phone. Hello, goodbye, bang. I don't need to go online. I'm not looking yeah. to make any new friends. I ain't looking to get this virtual reality lifestyle. I've no interest mm -hmm. in what's going on online. So it's what I do is I put my stuff out on social media mm -hmm. and that's it. I don't read comments. I have no interest. As long as I can do what I need to do to promote me fights or whatever I do on there, whatever it's used for, that's what I use it for. They're not personal sites. Mm -hmm. They're not like full of family pictures and following loads of people yeah. interests that I'm interested in. If you look at me social media, it's got 11, I follow 11 people or whatever, but it's all to do with what, what I do, like the boxing or whatever. I don't, I'm interested in cars and classic cars and pigeon, clay pigeon shooting and, and off-roading and defenders mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But that's not on there because it's, that's personal to me. What is your favourite car? Favourite car? Probably a Land Rover Defender. Really? Yeah. Or even though I can't fit in them on their uncomfortable <laughs> thing. Yeah. But it's more of an iconic British motor and I do like looking at them. Yeah. That's why I've got a few of them. They're not the most beautiful car, but I, I like it. I like the fact that they're like, because they're, they're quite practical. I, I bet you uh, do you use them quite a bit. Not really. No. I just look at them. They're toys to me. You know this book? I'm just wondering, what made you call it Behind the Mask? It sounds quite self-explanatory. Yeah, because like I said, the, the two characters I played, mm -hmm. people can read that now and see the real me. Yeah. Since I come back two years ago, for whenever I come back, June 18, mm -hmm. I've not had a mask on. I've not been being a performing monkey, as I used to call myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've just been being me. And people either like that or they don't. And I'm not selling stuff for promoters anymore. If they, if they ain't got the ability to sell their own shows, then they're not worth being with. Right. Before I was selling these shows, I was out there, I was grinding, I was mm -hmm. selling every day. I was trying to get people interested. I was doing this, I was doing that. Now, the promoters do their own job. That's what they get paid for. So uh, before I was doing everybody's jobs. Now I'm not, I'm just doing my own. Mm. You've broke through, haven't you? You've become that mainstream household name. Is that, are you proud of yourself for that or, or do you not care? Again, it's not really of a concern. Yeah. You seem to be really enjoying it, the WWE, by the way. I did enjoy it, yeah. yeah. It was very fun and it was a, it was a lifetime ambition achieved. Yeah. Did you watch it when you were a kid as well? Yeah, I grew up watching it. Who were your favourites? Bret Hart, uh, Triple H, yeah. Shawn Michaels, The Rock, Undertaker, Stone Cold, yeah. Mankind, Kane. Similar eras that I think we were. Yeah, we, we grew, grew up, up with on all the same. How old are you? I'm, uh, well, to get a guess. <laughs> oh. How old are you? 31. Yeah. 32. We're all. So, yeah, we're all the same kind of uh, uh, era in the rest My favourite was yeah. Stone Cold. Stone Cold Steve Austin, he was, was my favourite. Yeah. Which one did you meet, like, uh, which one was your favourite that you met in person? I met, I met them all. I really? met all the old time as well, Hulk wow. Hogan, Ric Flair. Rick was a, was a real uh, good man to go out and have a beer with. I bet. I had a beer with him in uh, Las Vegas, <laughs> and he was a character for sure. 70-year-old, but definitely a character. Do you think they're in awe of you a little bit? Because you are, I know they're performers, but you're a real yeah. fighter, do you know what I mean? I think it's, it, it's mutual. Right. I think they're a bit in awe of me and I'm a bit in awe of them for sure. Mm -hmm. Like for me, grew up watching these people on TV and like, then I, I'm there having a beer in Las Vegas with them. It's almost like fairy tale stories, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Who'd ever thought that I'd be over there with them people and shaking all Kogan's hand and him coming to wish me luck for the fight and all that. Yeah. It was it was a dream come true. It's ironic because obviously Mike Tyson went to the WWE as well and you're sort of following in his footsteps, crossing over. You had a re you had a massive wrestling match with Braun Strowman, who he looks like a unit. Like he looks a massive. This guy, uh, are you? What was it like facing off against him? Because although it is sort of theatrical, he's a beast. This guy. Yeah, listen, it was no different to facing off against any fighter I've ever faced off mm. against. Because when there's sixty odd, seventy thousand people screaming and shouting, and you're all up and your adrenaline's pumping, oh, yeah. I believed I was going into a battle like I always do. I said my little Spartan chant before I'm with the gang and we went to war. Mm -hmm. now, and whatever happens in there, I didn't feel any of it because the adrenaline was pumping. Even when I got slammed on the floor, ain't a soft canvas, it's like that. Oh, yeah. But you just don't feel it when you're in the midst of battle. Uh -huh. You don't feel getting punched in the face and you don't feel anything when you're in that mood, mindset. Uh, you've mentioned, is it Brock Lesnar you fan quite fancy a fight with? Yeah, I fancied a fight with Brock for sure. Yeah. 
That'll be a big one, wouldn't it? With him being a former UFC heavyweight champion, uh, did you watch his UFC fights at all? Yeah, wa- I watched a few of his fights for sure. It's pretty handy, like. Pretty handy, but I could flatten him inside. <laughs> <the way. laughs> Is there if anyone you don't WWE think? WWE match or in a proper fight? I could flatten Brock Lesnar in 30 seconds. Well, I've, I've seen you training with Darren Till. Shout out Darren Till, what a legend mm. he mm. is. And you do look good with all the limbs, not just the boxing gloves. Like, you could well, do yeah, it. Big shout out Darren Till. Yeah. Do you know, I've always been interested in, um, in fight. Yeah. It's what I've been born and bred at. It's what we come from. You know? yeah. Fighting is in our blood. Um, and whether it, whatever type of fighting it is, whether it's boxing, kickboxing, mm-hmm. MMA, wrestling, whatever it is, mm-hmm. it's all like contact sport, isn't it? And I think I'm athletic enough to do any any fight sport for mm-hmm. sure, no matter what it is. And I've got the right mentality where, yes, I can do anything I want to. And nobody can tell me, oh, it's too dangerous or mm-hmm. you're going to get your arm broke or whatever. If I, When I set my mind at doing a fight sport, then I do it. I've I seen think Frank Mir mm. offering to help you. We've had Frank Mir on before. Who yeah, better? He's a former heavyweight champion. Yeah, and so. the jiu-jitsu that he could like pass on so that if you are on the ground at any point, you know what to do to get yourself out of it. I mean, you'd be Dana White's dream. Yeah. That would be... Can you imagine, right, I sign a, a fight to fight Stipe, oh. their heavyweight champion, Man. and we have a, we have a crossover Because th- that would be bigger, in my opinion. It certainly would be better than Mayweather McGregor. Mm-hmm. Because... We'd, we'd really be getting a true fight there. It, it would, I, I felt like Mayweather just nullified McGregor and we didn't get what we'd well, hoped for. It was a for. boxing match, wasn't it? Exactly. If he come into a boxing ring on the boxing rules, uh-huh. it'd be 10 times worse than um, <laughs> yeah. McGregor and May, because at least McGregor knows how to box. Mm-hmm. And he's grew up around boxing. Yeah. The gyms in Dublin, they all box. Yeah. Everybody in Dublin can box. <laughs> There's about a million gyms there. <laughs> yeah. So Stipe, he can't box. Uh-huh. It wouldn't be a boxing contest. But... In that world, mm-hmm. I, I, I'd be intrigued to see if he could take what I could put out for sure. Them four rounds gloves would be so very different, wouldn't they? Would you be con, con, uh, confident, though, despite... Because people like Ngannou have called you out, and that guy, he's got that one-shot kill power. Um, and obviously, you've taken a hell of a lot of punches. You've taken the hardest punches of all time, even. Uh, would you want to go ahead and do it with him? Yeah, because I look at Francis Sengano and Stipe Mekovic, they're like six-round bill fillers if they were boxers. <laughs> they wouldn't even win a, a central area title. All right. So they can't box, they're uh-huh. just like brawlers. Mm-hmm. So I've been hit by the biggest punches in heavyweight history. Yeah. Deontay Wilder, all knockouts. Exactly. Dr. Steel, I'm a 60-odd knockouts. Yeah. And I'm still here telling the story. Uh-huh. So if I can't beat a six-round bill filler, as he's got the striking force of a middleweight, mm-hmm. yeah. It's different. It's different games. But listen, their game ain't to go standing up with me and, and punching because there's only one winner. And me with them four hands gloves on, I'd smash them all. But it's, they've got to try and take me to the floor. Mm-hmm. So if I put the time and effort into not getting tucked to the floor, then I believe I can chin them, just like Ray Merce did with Tim Sylvia. And I, I actually believe you could do that because you've got that... Um your hips are quite quick, like you move fast. And, yeah. and you see big guys uh, like Travis Brown, who married Ronda Rousey, he, he's sort of your build and he managed to learn it very quickly as well because he's similar, a light on his feet type guy. Well, the, the, the stand-up side of it, the uh-huh. boxing and the kicking and all that, I'm quite good with because oh, yeah. I've trained for kickboxing as well. Mm-hmm. But like obviously going down on the jiu-jitsu side mm-hmm. of it, it's a different world, isn't it? Yeah, we've seen Tony, um, who's the guy who fought Randy Couture? James Tony. James Tony, that was right. He struggled as soon as he hit well, the deck, didn't he? he James Tony was one of them people who, one of the best boxers has ever been. Yeah. But like, just does things for money, you know what I mean? He probably didn't even train for that fight. <laughs> no, he he had a gut like hanging over his trousers. Yeah. And it, it was what it was. It, it wasn't uh, It wasn't a vintage James Tony, to be fair. We, we see Conor McGregor offering to train you as well. I mean, that it couldn't get any better than that. You two Definitely, together. That's a dream team, Jesus. The Me, press Conor conferences. McGregor and Darren Till. <laughs> mm. Do you really think you would do it? Like, because there's you, you mentioned you'd, you'd be up for it, but obviously a lot of the boxing fans are praying that you wouldn't leave boxing. What would it take for them to get you in a UFC? Octagon? It wouldn't take a lot. I've got three fights left on my contract. When they're up, I'm coming for every UFC heavyweight there is. There you go then. Um, and who and is it Deontay Wilder next? Deontay Wilder next, February 22nd. Are you confident he gets past Ortiz and there's no issues there? You can't be confident in heavyweight boxing mm-hmm. because it only takes one punch to get knocked out, as we've seen many times. But you'd have to be confident. 
Ortiz has got to be a minimum of 48 to 49 years old. <laughs> I yes. love how we're guessing. He's got to be. It's crazy, isn't it? So he's a dangerous customer for uh-huh. four or five rounds. If not the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous heavyweights in the world for four rounds. Mm-hmm. Because even when you're old like that, you never lose your power. As we saw with George Foreman when he knocked out Michael Mora. He was 45 and he still chinned mm-hmm. the young Mora who, who stopped Holyfield in his prime. So, yeah, you never lose your power, but you'd have to fancy the younger, more active, more match fit, Wilder. How, how would you see that rematch going with Wilder after the last time? Because I felt like you should have won the decision as many Yeah, times. I think everybody in the world, apart from Deontay Wilder's family, thought I won the fight. <laughs> um, and that judge, Andre Rasheen, I don't know where he come from, mm. but whatever. Um, yeah, it, it was what it was, but it was expected because I went over to their show. I boxed on his own show, his own promotion, in his own country. So it was pretty much expected. You'd be, yeah, shafted then. Yeah. Do you see? My dad said I wouldn't get the decision out there before I left. Yeah. Mm. Um, But it's different now because Mm. they've got to come to me because now I'm the kingpin of America Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, they've got to come to me and, and work on my terms where before it was all on their terms, yeah. I was going to challenge Deontay Wilder. Deontay Wilder's got to come and challenge me. And is that is that contract signed? Is that yep. definitely happened? Okay, all right. It was signed before I fought Wallen. Right, okay. Then you were signed, everything's done. The, as a fan of you, there was like obviously concerns after the last fight because um, the fight beforehand, I mean, I think that might have been one of the best I've ever seen you, like untouchable. And then this fight... Uh, this guy gave you a real challenge to be fair he really yeah. put it on you and you showed that grit and championship determination to get the win but um, people were concerned your dad was concerned um, talks about should your coach stay on how do you feel when you look back at that fight now I loved it loved every minute of it 47 stitches what's that what's 47 stitches to a motherfucker like me can you please remind me <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Dude, you look fine I am now. a gypsy warrior. What's it. a cut going to do me or a few pints of blood pissing out everywhere? Yeah. Ain't nothing. I got a cut, big deal. Get over it. Mm-hmm. It is what it is. You can't go swimming and not get wet. Second cut in 11 years as, as a professional boxer. Uh-huh. Ain't too shabby. I loved it. It was it proper good for me because I wanted the drama. It was Mexican Independence Day. I wanted blood and snot all over that ring. And the fans got what they wanted. It was a great fight. Fought with one eye for like uh, nine rounds. Got cut in the third and went on to the 12th. Battled it out. It was what it was. It was lovely. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a great performance. Uh, ben said to me, how do you feel about round seven? I said, I live for this shit. I've seen that. This is what I live for. And I'm happy. I was happy. Happy I got caught. Bit of a screw loose, but whatever. Uh-huh. You know, it, it was a good 12 round fight and it put me in good stead for the Wilder fight. Is that when you feel most alive when, when you're being challenged yeah. and pushed? Yeah, it wasn't really a challenge. It was only a cut. Uh-huh. He, um, he was just getting battered every round. <laughs> he can take a good eye in, but, yeah. you know, he was a Viking, wasn't he, from yeah. Denmark or one of right. them countries, Sweden. Mm. So, yeah, they're, they're going to be tough men, aren't they? If you, if you ever want to pick a fight with someone, make sure it's a Viking, because they'll definitely <laughs> fight back. <laughs> Tell us about it. Um, so you feel like the adjustments will be made for the Deontay Wilder fight? Like the, the, will there be tweaks made from... Because people were talking about, did you come in heavy enough... Etc. Etc. Would you change anything for the Deontay Wilder fight from you? I there? wouldn't change. I don't. I don't train for a weight anymore. Really. Whatever I weigh in at, I weigh in at. It's like whatever I, I go in on the night. I'm, I'm not dieting. I'm already on my weight. Mm. Whatever I weigh, I weigh. I'm not trying to lose weight or put it on. Years ago, I would lose five or six stones to, to fight people. Yeah. But now I walk around at what I box at. So yeah, I go into training camp, train a couple of times a day, eat eat well, eat plenty, and whatever I weigh, I weigh. When you gained all that weight, I mean, how, how, what was your heaviest weight? Just under 28 stone. Jesus. That's a You've big... never even been that heavy. My, my heaviest was 25, so yeah. that says a lot. That's heavy though yeah. as well, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Try getting him halfway around the world. It's difficult going away <laughs> yeah, and holding with someone who's 25 stone. You lost um, about three stone in two days. It was amazing. You don't fit in the seats, do you? Nah, mate, it's a nightmare. I'm sure you know. Especially in economy. Um, what were you like? What was your lifestyle like in terms of what were you eating day to day? Was it just like big food all the time? No. I'm not a big eater. Really? And I wasn't then and I'm still not today. It was more like alcohol, right. pints of beer. I'd go out and have like, I don't know, 15, 16 pints on a night out, like no problem. 
Yeah. Then I go and have like a load of pizzas and stuff afterwards, mm-hmm. eating junk food, chocolates and sweets and stuff. But when you do that for two years and your body's used to training every day to get them calories off, it just keeps going on and on. I believe I'd, I, I wouldn't be alive today anyway, that's for sure. But if I was, then I'd probably be about 39 stone. You'd be on Jerry Springer sort of, help, <laughs> help me, Jerry. Yeah, yeah, someone cutting the side of his house yeah, off just to get him out. out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've seen you in the England shirt. You were partying with all the England fans. Like, You look like you were having a great time. But obviously, internally, there was a lot going on. But like, do you really love drinking or is it just a social thing? You, ha- you do it for a laugh. I like it as much as anybody else. Right. Who doesn't like to go out with the boys and have a few beers? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you haven't cut it out completely now? Oh, I was out with my dad on Sunday. We got legless. <laughs> Good effort. What's your favourite drink? Peroni. Peroni. It's yeah. quite sippable, isn't it? It goes down easy. Out of draft, though. Draft Peroni. Not mm-hmm. the bottles. I'm not keen on the yeah. bottles for some reason. A, um, they do taste different. It's, like it's got to be yeah. ice cold and, and it's not served in a Peroni glass, so there's a problem. Do you pay for drinks anywhere you go now? I don't mean that, that you're cheap. I mean, everyone just goes, Tyson, let me get you a drink. Let me get you a drink. I don't go out. I don't go out in public that often. Right. I won't go just to like some random place for drinks. Yeah. Yeah. Because I get tortured. Is the fame thing or something that you sort of, you're not interested in? Swerve it completely. It's practically the reason why I I live in Morecambe, because it's out the way. And everybody who lives there has seen me for the last 10, 11 years. Mm And yeah, there's not much going on there, so it doesn't attract a lot of people. You don't get that reaction as yeah. much. Do yeah. you feel at home there? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I've been there 11 years and I uh, I do like it there. Every day I wake up and say, you know what, I feel like I'm going to move, move back to where, like, to Manchester way. But I always come up with a reason why I should stay. So I think it's the place for me. Do you think you have quite a, um, a, a peaceful set of people around you as well? What about- yeah, I don't have many friends. Uh-huh. Uh, I've got a close knit um, friendships with a few people, and that's it. I don't, I don't see, I don't see that many uh, new people. Mm. Only when I go out and about and stuff like that. Obviously, I meet a millions of people. Mm. But like, yeah, I, I have the same friends now as when I started, basically ten years ago. In travelling, do you think uh, it's? They say travel broadens the mind. Do you think it's broadened your mind? I think so. Yeah. I think if you're stuck in a room all your life, you don't know what's going on in the world and you don't know what it's like. They say, if you haven't had it, you don't miss it. Mm -hmm. And that's so true. If you don't know what what it's like to experience other things, then you won't miss it. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. You get stuck in your ways and that's it. But traveling around does help and it's a wonderful thing to be able to to travel to different countries and and experience different cultures and different Mm -hmm. ways of going on and all that. And uh, it's it's really has, it's been good, you know, I've I've lived a good life for the last, I don't know, however many years, 20 years, um, 30 years, 31 years old. <laughs> you feel 20. It's been good. <laughs> yeah. I feel 60. I feel worn out. Really? I mean, you've done a lot. Yeah. You know, you're, um, I don't know why, but I'm picturing like where you live. Is, like, is it an estate with like a load of land type thing? You, no. No? I've got a normal five bedroom house next door to people and nothing sp- flash or special. Uh-huh. Just an average family house. Mm-hmm. Just normal. I'm just really imagining people uh, waking up in the morning. I bought it in 2014, and I'm still there now. I'm just imagining waking up in the morning and just sort of coming, you know, you're just doing the dishes in the window. Morning, Tyson. Yeah, it must be so unusual to see that would be you so putting weird. bins out next door, those kind of yeah, things. Yeah, it's like you don't expect to see a linear levyweight champion of the world just like roaming around doing yeah. normal things. That's what your neighbours all say. They all go, there goes the lineal heavyweight uh, yeah. champion of the world mowing the grass. There and they goes, announce the him out. as he walks past the house. <laughs> the <laughs> lineal! Yeah. All right. The only problem with my house is it doesn't have enough land for what I want. Right. If I had like an acre or half an acre more, mm. then I'd, I don't think I'd ever move. Can you clay pigeon shoot there? Or do you have to go somewhere else to do that? What, at home? Yeah. Well, if I clay pigeon shoot, I'd be clay pigeon shooting into the sea. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, no, you can't clay pigeon shoot there. Literally, don't I don't have any land. I have as, mm. about as big as this this room in here, mm-hmm. space for parking stuff. Wow, okay, that's it. Okay, a couple of defenders basically. W- one of my yeah. favorite bits of the book was when you talked about your wife Paris, yeah, and um, how you met, and it, it seemed very like uh, although you admitted you had your ups and downs, quite perfect. It was the story with me in Paris. It's like it was meant to be because we lived hundred mile apart, didn't know her from Adam, mm-hmm. and then we, we met each other on the off. That was it. We never we've been together ever since. And even before I was going out with Paris, I said to me dad, I said, I've found this girl and I'm gonna marry her. My dad said, What? I was about sixteen, one of them. And I said, I found this girl. <laughs> I said, I'm going to marry her. Yeah. He said, Well he said, Are you going out with your girlfriend? I said, No. Not yet. But I will do. And I did. 
the conversations early on, she seems to have a, a very good way of thinking that it would line up with the way you think, I could imagine. You, but was it always like that? Did you just click straight off? Yeah, we did. Click straight away. Mm -hmm. and behind every good man is a better woman. Yeah. And if I didn't have Paris, I wouldn't be the man I am today. I wouldn't be in this position. I'd probably be in partying somewhere in Miami with a load of... Yeah. Um, women and men and getting drunk every day and living the high life. But yeah. I think having wife and kids ground you because you've got responsibilities. You can't just run around doing all that stuff. And she's actually a pretty good boxing pundit, by the way. Like when Coogan interviews her, I'm like, God, she knows a lot. Do you know what? <laughs> yeah? It's like, I say to her, this, I say, oh, you won't know this, but she's always, I've been around boxing 11 years and I say okay. the name, he's going, shit, he's from there, blah, blah, blah. He's had that many fans. I'm like, okay. Genuinely. She really does, but how yeah. has she not gone? All we ever talk about home is boxing. <laughs> and my dad comes, or the boys, or my friends. Yeah. All they want to do is put boxing on, or watch fights, mm -hmm. or talk about boxing. So she's there, she hears it all, and yeah. she's been around a long time, so she, she does understand it. I was only speaking to her a couple of days ago, and it's come to the point where she don't want me to box. Now. Really? She don't see the need in it. We don't need to box on. Uh -huh. And it frightens, very frightening for her. Like even against the last two opponents and even the comeback and the wilder fight, she feels sick now. She feels ill watching it. She don't want me to do it. How do you handle that as the husband? It's my job, isn't it? So I must continue and it's not going to happen forever. Mm -hmm. And that's it. We, we move on. But with all the tragedies that's been happening of late, yeah. it's, it's, you've, got, you've got to think, haven't you, as well? Like when is enough enough? Well, you say it's your job, but it isn't like a normal job. And I'm sure she'll be aware of when you, of the dangers. Do you need to carry on financially? Is it is it your job or is this? Are you now doing it it's for you? It's not a job anymore. It's yeah. an obsession. Yeah. When I first started in boxing, my, my goal and ambition was to to buy my own house out of boxing. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I could do that, there's been a lot of boxers in the past that I've, I've trained them, dedicated their life, and they, they don't ever have anything out of it. Mm -hmm. So I thought to me, if I want to start, if I can just do that, then I'll be happy. But it, then it was a job. Now it's gone from a job to an obsession. And when you've got that boxing bug, you can never get rid of it. It's actually funny because uh, those two YouTube lads, I actually know both of them and I've actually like said on a recent video, I think they should just like finish now. Like you've got the money, you don't get knocked out, great, let's leave it at that. Mm. Um, but I'm not their wife, so they're not going to no. listen to me. as much as you'd love to be, you're not their wife. <laughs> um, yeah. What's Tyson Fury the dad like? What are, you, are you old school in your dad approaches as well or do you, do you see yourself becoming a bit more... You know, new school sometimes. Like what? I, yeah, I don't know. Like, I suppose, you know, the old school era, you imagine quite a disciplinarian or are you a bit more leave no, that of the mother? Over, for sure. Really? Yeah. yeah. You've got that in your eyes. You can sort of tell. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I don't want to spoil the kids because I think it has an effect on them when they grow up. Right. Yeah. Uh, I want them to be their own independent people, get their own jobs and do their own thing and have dreams and ambitions of their own. Mm. So, yeah, I don't want to spoil them too much, but it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to, to not. How are you going to treat people who you love and who you've bred and not want to give them everything and do mm -hmm. everything you can for them? So there's, there's got to be a, a, an in-between somewhere. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I try and do I try and be the best that I can be. And that's, I can't say any more, can I? Try and, I try and take on places and do, yeah. when I'm at home, do as many stuff as we can, as many activities as we can together mm -hmm. and enjoy it. And that's it. Do they get to watch your box or? Not not live. They've been to one live fight, but they watch all the fights on the TV, yeah. I bet they're thrilled about WWE. Thrilled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My son and daughter are big wrestling fans. So really? They loved it. If one of those wanted to be a fighter one day, how would you react to that? Each to their own. If, if that's what they want to do, then let him do it my son he don't want to be a boxer he wants to be uh, a wrestler really so yeah an MMA fighter and a wrestler he really? can't get enough of it so I'm not going to discourage him I'm just going to let him see what he wants to do with it and if he wants to do that he can my older daughter she wants to be a dancer so she goes to the dance school and she's doing that and I'm encouraging it so hopefully she gets your footwork him. as a parent yeah. I can only support them yeah. whatever they want to do I'm sure they're going to have a million things that they want to do and let go and let go and do this do that that's all a part of growing up isn't it have you always had that then, though, that, you know, obviously when you're a kid, you're picking all these things up. Will you always fight? Yeah. There was nothing else I wanted to be apart from a boxer. Right. Ever. Some kids, they, they try things and don't do that. Football, skating, wrestling, boxing, whatever. I never did anything else apart from box. Did that feel natural to you? Yeah. 
I felt natural, very natural. Mm. It's interesting. It's interesting because, yeah, you don't meet many people who seem to have such a clear path in life. Did that make you more sure of what... It was so clear that your yeah. dad even called it practically from birth, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. He came out punching. Didn't he say you were going to be heavyweight champion of the world? From, um, was it from birth? I mean, that's clear. <laughs> as, I mean, as careers officers go, that was a good call. Do you know I, what I mean? I, I believe that things are meant to be, though. You believe in fate. That's interesting. That yeah, I believe in fate, and I believe in things are meant to happen because I was a newborn baby. You can't, you can't say this child is going to be heavyweight champion, not unless he can look forward thirty years. Yeah. But Did he have tarot cards out by any he chance? Must <laughs> he must have done. But how is it possible that a newborn baby was called after the heavyweight champion of the world? And that newborn baby becomes heavyweight champion of the world. What are those odds? I'm not a gambling man, yeah. but they'd have to be astronomical yeah. odds for sure. You were premature as well, weren't you? Yeah. So I'm um, like quite severely premature as well. I'm not sure severely. I was no? seven weeks premature. Yeah. Okay. Right. Oh, well, I, yeah. To me, that's still quite a lot. A lot oh, I don't, I don't yeah. know much about it. I don't. I saw some. I <laughs> He's saw already some, had five. Kids. I'm not a midwife. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I saw. I saw an uh, article in the paper yesterday, front page. Born at 26 weeks. Yeah. So that's premature. Yeah. yeah. Extremely there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Are you, yeah. are you, oh, this is a mad, I never thought I'd ask this question, but when, obviously when Paris has had the children, have you been in the room where that's happened? Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what are you like under those, pre that pressure situation? Oh, love it. Yeah? Yeah. You're excited? Excited, waiting on the new arrival. Yeah. It's like the labour takes ages, doesn't it? Sometimes mm. it can take two days. Yeah. Sometimes it can take two hours. Who are chooses you, the name? Yeah. Mutually. We, really? we choose a yeah. name together. It sounds quite nice. Yeah. Are you a bit of a corner man when you're uh, when she's in there? Are you kind of you know icing the face and yeah. all those kind of things? Everything. Yeah. Everything you can think of. Yeah. I'm even taking the gas and air for her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah this is good. That's good. Do you, uh, listen, do you, it's a family effort. Like yeah. I say, me and Paris have been together from being kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's nothing I don't know about her, and there's nothing she don't know about me. Yeah. We're open books with each other. So there's no secrets. That's rare these days as well. That, no, I mean, I don't know anyone who, who got married so young and is still together all those years. It just doesn't happen. Is there a, a trick to it that you feel like you have got that people haven't got these days? It's not easy to find someone as good looking as me. <laughs> <laughs> That's tricky. Yeah. I don't know what it is, you know what I mean? We've been together for a long time. We, we understand each other. Practically, all men are the same, I believe. So you're better probably with a devil you know than one you don't. So that's probably got a little bit to do with it oh. as well. Um, and you know it's in our culture to stick together as well mm -hmm. it's like she knows that like I just said most men are the same anyway so there's not much point in switching and choosing every 10 minutes when something upsets you mm -hmm. and that's it that's just the way we are do you argue like regular people we used to do years ago but uh, we don't we don't argue anymore really the, the, the ingredients to a happy life is a happy wife and how you make your wife happy is just say yes <laughs> <laughs> Write it down, lads. If you're Write listening, down, can we get this down? There. Yeah. A happy wife equals a happy life. I love it. And how you make your wife happy? Three, say, three, yes. three letters. Yes. Yes. Mm. That's it. it. And I believe when that wife's happy, the home's happy. Mm. When the home's happy, everything stems from your home. Mm -hmm. So if I've got an upset home life, then that's going to affect me at work. It's going to affect me at my training place. It's going to affect me in workplace. It's going to affect me everywhere. So it may be an old housewife's tale, happy wife is an happy life, but I, I, I believe it to be 100% true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because if ever I've got like arguments going on or upsetments in my own home, nothing ever goes right outside of it. You don't, you don't think straight. You're not focusing on your job. Your mind's elsewhere. And if your mind's elsewhere, you can't concentrate 100% on what you've got to do in life. Do you have anyone in your life that um, you seem very self self motivated and self driven, and obviously you're such a presence that uh, you know I've, I've listened to other interviews with you, and a lot of those people are almost uh, they skirt around things. They don't feel like they can challenge you. Almost, do you feel like there's anyone in your life that can challenge you or sort of go, Tyson? I think you're wrong on that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I don't have I don't have things where I can be wrong or right. Right. I don't get into debates with people either. Yeah. It's like I've got a brother, Shane. And he's one of them people who's got to be right everything he does. Mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. right, you're wrong. And I've learned the hard way, because we've had a million fights together, that challenging people on what they think, on their opinions, only leads to an argument. Right. And it's something that I'm not interested in, arguing mm -hmm. over nothing. So if someone says, oh, this is right, and I, I, even if I disagree, I'll say, yep, 
that's right and that sometimes upsets them even more <laughs> that I don't want to challenge them on what yeah. I'm saying yeah some people just want an argument or a fight yeah. Don't they? Yeah. yeah sometimes a good argument is good though isn't it sometimes yeah, you just need one yeah but yeah I don't I don't challenge people on anything they, they think or say if it's right it's right okay who am I to say it's not you know what I mean it's one of them fighting wise me in Paris yeah. we always have like little bits and bombs like yeah, she'll say this I'll say that she wants to prove me wrong whatever I'll do the you same. should have used the uppercut on Klitschko earlier yeah <laughs> this like is that. over dinner and the kids are just watching <laughs> just sort of like where but yeah we, we don't argue anymore and I don't have anyone in my life where we argue with right I'm not one of them people who oh it's my way or the highway mm-hmm. I'm open to do whatever. If, if we're all going out, we've all got suggestions of what we're going to do today. Mm-hmm. It ain't just I do what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I'm like one of those people who'll go, go with the flow. If you want to go wherever you want to go, you want to do what you want to do, I'll come with you. Mm-hmm. It ain't just my way, like I'm the man, you follow me. Because I'm, I'm not into all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Power trips on my own uh, immortality. A lot of shite. Uh, all my friends and family, they don't treat me like I'm <coughs> someone, uh, a sporting man or whatever. Right. I'm just a normal person to them. You seem actually quite opposite of your fighting personality. It's like really opposite. Yeah, it is. It's almost like a different person completely. Yeah. So laid back, so chilled out, whatever you want to yeah. do, I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really bothered. If, say, the only thing I ever do in life is we go out for something to eat, we take the kids out somewhere, uh-huh. or we go to a boxing fight or a wrestling event or whatever it is. So if anyone's got any other suggestions that they want to do something, I'm all ears. Mm-hmm. I'm always up for new challenges and new things to do. Yeah. Passing time away and all that, yeah. So I'm not I'm not caught up on my own own uh, self. Is that the same when it comes to boxing training as well? Because obviously there are so many people who've got so many different techniques of, you know, oh, we should train this way, we should, we should do it that way. Is it you who decides that or what does, how does that work? Basically, people can try and make a boxing fight into rocket science and especially today like with all this new technology and all these people with university degrees on sports science they think they can implement that into old-fashioned fighting and it just doesn't work for heavyweights Mm. now i'm all for it when someone's making a weight and they're struggling then all this new technology and new science stuff really does work because one of my good friends isaac lowe is a featherweight and he always struggles with the weight. To get that last stone off is hard for him. The last seven pound. And if they don't do that diet correct, then he struggles and it comes in his performance. Mm-hmm. But heavyweight boxing is a different breed, different sport to other boxing. Where there's no weight categories, it's a different world completely. And all those scientists and all the things, all this new technology that comes out, I just don't believe it works for heavyweights. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got a strength and conditioning guy, I've got a nutritionist, and I've got a a trainer. And they all work together on things they want to do and want to don't do and all this and that. And I say to them, look, keep it very basic. None of the rest of the stuff works. There's three rules to boxing. Train hard, eat well, and get your rest. Especially for heavyweights, there's nothing else. Because when you want to start implementing all these different technologies into your game, improvements, 1% here and there, it's a lot of shite, to be honest with you. Andy Ruiz, let's just use him. He's, he's a great example. Mm-hmm. Little fat pig, comes in on three weeks notice, yeah? Murdered every donut and taco in the whole of California, yeah? And then goes in with a man who's had a 12-week training camp with every sports scientist in the United Kingdom. And whatever else he's done, he's broke every art monitor in sight. <laughs> he's done every CrossFit machine. He's done everything totally correct. And he's had the best nutrition and the best diet you can get. But the little fat fella goes in there and bowls him over in seven rounds. Mm-hmm. How do all them scientists look at me then and say, this is better, this is how you should do it? Mm-hmm. Because they can't. Because it's still one-on-one combat and anything can happen. So do you think AJ is wasting his money? <laughs> It's all mental. He looks it's all, good. It's all, it's all in the mind. He looks good on Instagram. I, I believe like you can get all them people, and if you think and you believe mm-hmm. that they're going to improve you, right? Then they probably so will. Like a placebo effect. Yeah, but I believe there's no substitute for hard work and, and dedication to the mm-hmm. job. And that's it. And now when when my nutritionist says, "Oh, we we'll want you to eat this, that, and over," I say, "No, I'm going to have a Mars bar, chocolate biscuit, and a cup of coffee with ten sugars in, because it's not going to alter my performance because I'm an heavyweight. And if you've got anything to say about it, go and watch the Andy Ruiz Anti Joshua fight. Do you, do you take your tea with ten sugars? 
Yeah. I love yeah. the fact that this this nutritionist just made him this lovely salad. <laughs> yeah. Fucking the thing yeah. is, though, here's, so here's another taste. thing, yeah? I don't eat salad and I don't eat veg at all. No go areas. Right. But your skin looks great. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> Kids, if you're but listening But I don't eat home. salad and I don't eat veg at all. To right. no extent. They Why not? Do you not like I it? I just don't like it. Yeah. Is it in the genes? Is that a genetic thing, Dad? I mean, Dad eats all of it. I don't like it at all. I think it's vile. I eat it every day. Look, it's all of it. Okay. Yeah, I, eat, I can eat fruit. Yeah. When you're your dad's age, you might wish you had have done. Yeah, whatever. Never, knows. never yeah. mind in, in 20 years. What can happen tomorrow? Do you, are, you, are you a meat eater at all? Do you like your meat? I, I like meat. I like fish. Right. I say I don't eat any veg. I eat like I can eat potatoes okay. and sweet corn and, and peas and stuff like that. Yeah. Sweet potato stuff mash. that you can put gravy on. Basically. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. yeah, something you can make chips out of. Oh, right. Right. I love it. <laughs> you two are so similar. It's uncanny. <laughs> do, you yeah. know what, um, do you know what Andy Ruiz? You're on about there. This this rematch that's happening very very soon. I'm really excited for this. I feel like this is the biggest test of AJ's career. How do you see the rematch going? I see it going pretty much similar to the first fight. Really? Now, I know that they've both lost some weight and whatever, they've had more time to prepare and they've changed a few things in the training teams and camps mm. and all that. I mean, they'll have different approaches and they're going to try different game plans. But Mike Tyson said it, and it's very true. Everyone's got a great game plan until they get punched in the face. Mm -hmm. And it's so true. You can be working on something for ages and then you work on it, work on it, work on it, and you get tagged. And that's it. You go back to how you once was and you want to fight. Mm. And that's exactly what I see happening. Because AJ, a lot of people forget that, but AJ did drop Ruiz first, but it, yeah. was, it was at that point that the real fight started almost. Yeah, that's and, true. And do you think that Ruiz is just too good of a technical boxer for him? I, I don't believe he's too good at anything because heavyweight boxer and they're both big, strong men and okay. they both can knock each other out, as we've seen. But what it is with me, what my opinion of that fight is, he beat him once and knocked him out, so he's got a mental edge going into the right. rematch. For whatever excuse they made or whatever the problem was in camp or in the changing rooms or whatever, you're going into that mentally beaten already because you've already been knocked out by somebody. Mm -hmm. So if we go outside now and you knock me out, yeah, but I think I'm, a, I'm a, some big great boxing champion and I get flattened, yeah, then I've got to be thinking about that going into the rematch, haven't I? Mm -hmm. Or if you say, all right, we want to fight you again, and I say, oh, okay then, just because I'm forced to, mm -hmm. I know in my mind you've already chinned me. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason I try and make up, or oh, I got the flu, or I wasn't looking at that time, I wasn't ready, or whatever. I know you've already knocked me out. So the mental side, of I believe boxing is 95% in the mind anyway, and 5% fitness and nutrition mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So yeah, I think... When, when you've already been beat by someone and it wasn't like it was a lucky punch that knocked him out. Like, you see Lennox Lewis got knocked out by Rackman and Oliver McCall. Yeah. He was winning the fights and he got ch chinned. That's it, fair play, everybody mm -hmm. boxing. He come back and he, he won them in the rematch. Joshua wasn't winning that fight. I didn't give him... I didn't give it. I may have given him one round out of the seven. It wasn't like is that the style of, of Ruiz? That's just too much, uh, too difficult for him. Do you think everybody has a bogeyman, right? In in the career, and whether you find him or not, everybody's got one. Really? Like I remember when Tony Thompson knocked out David Price, and he tried to rematch him. That was his bogeyman. He found him, lost twice. Yeah. Um, I remember when Tony Thompson did it to Solis as well, the great Cuban that was going to be mm -hmm. a world champion. Found his bogeyman and beat him twice. And I, I, I think personally, he may be the bogeyman for him. Who knows? But listen, that's what boxing is. That's why it's an interesting fight. That's why we can all watch it whenever it is December. Tune mm. in. It's funny it. that um, Ruiz called you out all like a lot of years ago. Uh, I think it was on IFL, actually. And uh, now we might actually end up seeing that at some point. Do you, how do you see yourself matching up with Ruiz? Because he has got an awkward style. It's awkward style, but he's tailor-made for me. It's, he's, he's a six foot one or two and squat, leaning forward. Really? Yeah, that, that style is easy for me. Is that like the Chisora fight? That's that Chisora style, yeah. isn't it? Is he any better than Derek Chisora? A good Derek Chisora on a good night? I don't think so. I handled that quite comfortably. Closed my eyes, actually, some of the times. <laughs> One hand behind my back and stuff like that. Mm. You know, that style is easy for me. Yeah. It's easy for me to just jab and move. 
like Klitschko would would make easy work of um, Ruiz because that style for him is easy. Really? That that stature, that that style. He's fought loads of them. I've fought loads of them all my career. <clears throat> the average size heavyweight is six foot one, two, mm-hmm. three, seventeen, eighteen stone, mm-hmm. and they swing hooks and throw one twos. But it's the ones that are awkward and gangly or different style that, that people struggle with. The, the, the conventional styles are always easy to beat. Do you think you'll have a fight, uh, AJ? Depending on how he gets on in his rematch. I'd love that. I think it would be fantastic for Britain. It, it would be, but it won't be in this, this contract because I, I, all my fights are in America now. Yeah. So, yeah, it'd have to be after that if it did ever happen. But if he gets knocked out twice in a row, I can't see him continuing, to be fair. Every man does what he wants to do. But I think... I think do you think he'd ret- retire? Well, he, he doesn't need the money. And yeah. two knockout losses is a shattering uh, to, your, mm-hmm. to your career. But it, it would be up to them, whatever they do. But I've got three fights left. So whoever them three fights are, I don't really care, to be fair. Line them up. Whoever's <laughs> the best at that time, let them fight me. That's it. And how do you see your fight with uh, Wilder going um, by comparison to last time? Do you think it could go the same way? Or? To be honest with you, it was an easy fight for me last time. Uh-huh. It wasn't even competitive in the boxing side of it. Yeah. The only thing good about Wilder is he's got a massive punch and he can end the fight at any time, which we almost saw in round 12 and round 9. Yeah. So, yeah, just more of the same. And just, I'll be match fit this time. I only had a couple of fights last time and then the big, the big layoff. This time, it'll, I'll be match fit, ready. And we'll see. Yeah, he seems to be making a lot of excuses, but that's the one thing he never brings up is the fact that you were like 28 stone a matter of but months. He's not going to, is he? Yeah. Because again, it's mental, isn't it? Boxing again. He can't admit that I had three years out the ring and come back and, and fought him. Uh-huh. That doesn't come in. He thinks he fought the best Tyson Fury ever. I can't get... He said, he said in an interview, Tyson Fury can't get any better than that, mm-hmm. but I can but I don't know how he figured that out because I just had three year out of the ring balloons, tough with mental health problems, lost 10 stone, had two combat fights in six months and, and jumped in with the best heavyweight out there. So, yeah, obviously I'm afraid to fight him. And you've been sort of working and building this fight into a much bigger fight in the rematch. Do you think you're going to be, you're going to see much bigger numbers now because the first fight and it's going to actually, all this planning is going to come off? Um, I've not been considered, or concerned rather, really? considered. I've not been concerned about what Deontay Wilder's doing in mm-hmm. that fight. I've just been continuing my boxing career. Mm-hmm. I had the two fights, two boxing fights, I've had the wrestling match. I've just been enjoying my life. I don't, yeah. I don't live other people's lives. They might be concerned of what I'm doing, or because I always see him in interviews and or mentioning me, or oh, stupid yeah. wrestling and all this, that and the other and whatever, but you never see me talk about them. I'm no real interest. When the fights happen, they happen. And what they do in their own life, in their own careers, is none of my business at all. There was a few people tweeting from your fans' point of view, actually, saying, is Tyson Fury doing the right thing when he's about to go and take on Johnny Wilder and he's taking on Braun Strowman? Should he be... Tra- do you, will that affect you in any way coming into a rematch? I won't think about Deontay Wilder until I go into training camp in January. Really? Yeah, I'm not, I won't be thinking about him all year or whatever. I've no interest. It's a boxing match. Yeah. We're going to go in there, we're going to punch each other in the face, and one of us are going to win. Or if, if the shit happens again, we have a draw. That'd be exciting, wouldn't it? <laughs> Two draws. Fight. Make so, it yeah. a trilogy. Do you know, I don't, I don't think about these guys while I'm not, not really? fighting them. It doesn't affect me. Like I did see an Instagram post the other day directly to him saying that you were going to do him. Yeah, only because he keeps, he keeps doing all um, interviews and things saying, oh, he's afraid to fight me and all that. But mm-hmm. I don't know how he, how he can say that when he knows the contract's signed anyway. It seems like you have um, quite an interesting relationship with your phone. Uh, like it's a, it's really something that's quite impulsive for you. You can kind of pick it up and you'd be like, right, here, I'm going in or I'm taking a video yeah. of me dancing or I'm calling Eddie Hearn at 3 Yeah, we had Eddie Hearn on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. He said he'd give him a, a quick ring saying you should have signed me instead of AJ or something like that or just saying uh, you were going to destroy AJ. You know what? Eddie is a prat and I'm going to give him no publicity. So really? On. Fair Go enough. On. Yeah, okay. I didn't know that. So I yeah. didn't know um, you didn't get on with him. Yeah. No okay. comment. Fair enough. Fair play. Do you, um, do I've you got in- a question about oh, boxing sure. training, though. Because it seems like when you brought um, Ben Davison in, that, um, I don't know, like, when you're training, a lot of it seems to be more about getting fit than learning new boxing techniques. You seem to feel like you've got boxing. Is that the way you train? Or do you spend time out of the, when you're not in camp, learning new things? No, do I, Eck? How are you going to teach a lineal heavyweight champion, one of the best boxers in history, how to box? If I couldn't box, I won't, I won't be where I am. Not, I, I, I don't some people that. have that attitude of always yeah. evolving. No, I'm not, I'm not evolving at all. 
<laughs> you can't teach me anything about boxing. No it. one can, because what I don't know about boxing ain't worth knowing. That's true. Yeah. And yeah. what made you develop a style that people a lot of the time relate to lighter weight boxers? Was that always a... It's just natural. I'm not natural athletic. Yeah. And, move and all, all heavyweights walk forward and swing big bombs so I thought to myself I'm going to be different to the rest I'm going to use me footwork and, oh. and, and box that's what it's about but it's always been natural to me boxing and moving and, and not a lot of big men can do it and keep it up for so, such a long time like 12 rounds and that how, how much of it uh, is natural and how much of because you are a heavyweight historian how much of it is observed and stuff that you think you've sort of picked up down the years because you do seem to weigh other men up very quickly when you're talking yeah. about someone it doesn't seem like you've sort of um you've had to really study him. It seems like you've just looked at him and gone, and you've taken it all in. Yeah, it's like when, when I've got these fights coming up, and whoever it may be, I know I don't need to study them because mm. I already know them. Like being a historian, I know what stance they are, I know what style they are, I know how tall they are, I know how many fights they've had, I know who they've fought, I know what the weaknesses are, I know what their strengths are. So I don't need to watch them because I'm very familiar with them. And if it was somebody I didn't know, then, then obviously I'd do some work, but... It's my job to know everybody in the division who's going to be coming up challenging. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I do weigh them up quite quickly. And with, within a round or so, I know what to do with them. Can you remember the point in your boxing career, especially when you were younger, where you thought, yeah, I'm going to be the champ? Was there a mo Can you remember a moment that, that came to your head? Yeah, when I first put a pair of boxing gloves on. <laughs> I didn't come into boxing to be a boxer. Yeah. I didn't come into boxing to, to be a a national champion or whatever. I come into boxing to be the heavyweight champion of the world or nothing. That was my attitude. From the first amateur boxing fight I ever had, I was going to be heavyweight champion of the world. There was no doubt. I always believed it. Was your dad helpful in actually instilling that belief since he called it so early? Was, was that put into your head as well by other people? Or? No, no, it wasn't put into my head. It was all like I believed it. I wanted to. My dad told us not to box. My dad didn't want us boxing. But I, I wanted to go boxing. I wanted to go to the gym. I used to jog to the gym, ride the bike to the gym, run home, all that sort of stuff. Didn't take me there or whatever. I was never forced to go to the gym. I always just went there on my own accord. And I believe that's the best way because if you want it more than your son wants it, as you see with a lot of fathers today, they push their kids into doing something that they want to do. Yeah. And if the, if the child doesn't want to do it, then you're wasting your time because it's going to come to a point where, break point, where they don't want to do it and they just walk away from it. Mm. And that's what it was for me. Like, you, I see a lot of people pushing the kids towards boxing or whatever, but you've got to really want it more than anybody else. And I was the first person in the gym, the last person to leave every day. And there was nothing I wanted more than to become heavyweight champion of the world. And I trained hard, I dedicated, sacrificed my life for it, and it happened. So mm. I probably was one of the lucky ones. But when I think about it, Going back to it was all meant to be. You can only be and achieve things like that if you're able to bodily well and if your eyesight's good and mm -hmm. you've not got any problems with, with your health. And, mm -hmm. you know, all these things have to be in order as well to mm -hmm. allow you to do it. So I was probably lucky that I was born with all the right faculties in order to enable me to, to be a boxer. So yeah, it all it all fitted in like a jigsaw puzzle to bit together. It's been a long hard work. There's been a lot of people put a lot of time in. You know, it hasn't been me on my own. I've had a lot of input from other people, other boxing trainers. Um, it's been it's been a long long process. Hours, I won't say millions of hours. It's been of practicing the same stuff day in day out and until you practice it that much. You can do it with your eyes closed. I've already so, got a few questions left for you because I know we're against the clock. I don't want to keep you too long, guys. How long have we been here now? Uh, it's been a little while. Um, All just, good podcasts go on for ages, though. You know that, don't I you? Mean, yeah. norm, we've done a few you long ones. You could do a 10-minute one. It'd be shit. Exactly. I mean... Tell the Guardian. Um, the longer the podcast goes, the more viewers happen. The longer well, the video... I'm happy to keep to going if we're allowed, yeah. but I was... Just do another yeah. two hours if you want. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, she's, tef she's told me. Like, right, okay. She told yeah. me we've got to go. You let you say it. You've got to say yes to women, so I'm keeping to what she said. Sure. Um... So when does boxing end for you in your head? How do you see the final fight? The final, when you say in that, on that microphone, this is it for me, can you imagine that? No, I'm not there yet. Mentally, I'm not there mm. yet. I don't know how it ends. I don't know where it ends. I've got three more fights left and then I'm, I'm finished. You're very young still for a heavyweight as well. There's 31, plenty. but I've been, I've been turned pro at 20, don't forget. Yeah. A lot of these guys don't turn pro till 26, 27, 30 year old. Yeah. So I, I've had a, lot, a long time in it. 
you got the males on the clock. Um, 11 years as a professional <clears throat> heavyweight. It's a long time. Mm-hmm. You've got to make space for your music career as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One of the other questions I do like to ask people is, if your life was turned into a movie, and I guess this could be a movie, to be fair, this book, um, you know, like in Rocky, where there's the halfway point where he's like, not today. Like, and it's something to the turning point of his whole life. What is the turning point of your life? I'd probably say was the moment I walked into a boxing club. Mm-hmm. Because without that day happening, if I would have went with my dad to the shop instead of going to the Steve Egan's Boxing Academy, then maybe I won't be the boxer I am today. I won't, I won't be here. Maybe I'd be living a different life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And maybe I, I, I've, I can't imagine living a different life and not being the person I am. But obviously, it was a very high possibility that that could have happened. Mm. So, yeah, I think the turning point for me was entering a boxing gym for the first time, my going to my local amateur boxing club mm-hmm. and, and putting in the work and the dedication mm. because it all stemmed from there, everything stemmed from there, and it wouldn't be possible without that. And a lot of people like to take credit for what, what's happened in my career. There's been a lot of boxing trainers and a lot of people, but one man, he never really gets enough credit, and that's Steve Egan. He was my first ever amateur boxing trainer, and we put in... Hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and years from 14 to 20. That's in this book, yeah. Mm. Of, of training five, six days a week. Mm-hmm. Was that the foundation of you? As 100%. A we put in a lot of time, a lot of time. And when I wasn't the Gypsy King, when I never had a Rolls Royce, when I never had no money, when I couldn't afford a bag of chips on the way home, you know, Steve saw a young kid who put a lot of time into him. I'm very thankful to him. That's why I put him in that book. Mm-hmm. Why well, I give him a good, good uh, write up and, and put a good picture in with him, because he does deserve a lot of credit. And without Steve Egan, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be on this um, journey that I'm on. That's for sure. Sometimes yeah. you need a mentor. I guess every great boxer has one. Yeah, and he, he, he always believed in me from being, from being 14. Mm-hmm. He said I'd be heavyweight champion of the world. <laughs> so yeah, that had a lot of, that gave wow. me a lot of belief yeah. as well. You know what I mean? As, along with my family and friends mm-hmm. and everybody else. But yeah, he was the first like stranger to believe in me, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. You talk about people taking credit. I know this might sound like a silly question, but are you proud of yourself? Because you know you talk about not feeling fulfilled when you've had these goals. People like you sometimes, they're not proud of themselves deep down enough as what they should be. Do you feel proud of yourself? I think proud is not one of my things that I, I um, have pride Mm -hmm. but I've definitely achieved everything I wanted to do Mm -hmm. and I'm definitely happy with if I never boxed again I'm happy with what I've done and it was great when I beat Klitschko that was the Everest for me it doesn't get any better never will get any better than that beating Wilder beating anybody it will never beat November 28th 2015 that was the be all and end all of my boxing career that was when it was about boxing Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when it was about achieving my dreams and all that this second career has been more fun it hasn't been about boxing it's been it's been a fun it's been a laugh we've had a good time and the comeback losing the weight it's been it's been a fairy tale story the comeback it's been like we've had banter we've had fun it's not really been serious it's been fun and games and I believe it's been it's been it's been nice, rather than all the hard times and all the hardship and mm-hmm. everything that went on in my life and all the ups and downs. The second career has been it's been fun and I've really enjoyed it. It's been it's been probably the best best part of it all because there was no pressure. Mm-hmm. It wasn't about becoming world champions and winning all. It wasn't about winning or losing. It wasn't about who am I going to fight. And the the struggle was over. I was boxing now for me. I wasn't boxing for history, I wasn't boxing for a belt, I wasn't boxing to become wealthy or wasn't boxing for fame or anything else. I was boxing for my happiness. That's when you're in your most best place. So, yeah, Mm -hmm. that's been another turning point for me, coming back and enjoying my life and Mm -hmm. career. And I believe without that breakdown, I wouldn't have found this happiness that I found today, true happiness. Breakdowns breakthrough. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, Well, I've only got one last question. Fire away, (laughs) Mosh. How would you like to be remembered? And I get that asked, question asked a lot, and I'm going to give exactly the same answer as I always do. Mm. Very short and sweet. Not interested. <laughs>
I because when, when, when you're being remembered, it means you're done and you're finished. Uh-huh. And I ain't mentally ready for that yet. Oh, fantastic. Mm. That's well, fantastic. Great, great. Thank you very much for this interview. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. It's been good. It's been, it's been a great podcast. It's really it? nice just to chat to you and yeah, have you for over an hour. If anyone oh. wants to get this, I'm sure it'll be in shops everywhere and Amazon. I'm sure you're going to see that big mouth with the beard yeah. every every supermarket you go in. <laughs> I like this this back picture as well. Fantastic. It's a that really was good when book. I got up in round nine or twelve yeah. and I shouted at him, "Come on, I love it, love let's it. have it." Um, we were watching that, weren't we? That was good. That was a turning point in the fight. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, if, if you haven't already, hit the like button, subscribe to the True Jordan YouTube channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you later. Thanks very much. Guys. Great podcast, man. Thank you very much.